everyone. Today's video covers the surgical management of colon cancer. Now, it's important to not get too far into the weeds. You can definitely get uh, pretty far out in a lot of really niche situations when it comes to cancer. So we're just going to stick to basic principles related to colon adenocarcinoma today. So the topics we'll be covering first, what's the basic staging workup of a colon cancer, and then go a little bit deeper into the actual TNM components of that staging. Uh, basic indications for surgery, surgical principles, a uh, few unique situations that you'll need to deal with when it comes to colon cancer, and then finally a summary of everything we talk about. All right, so first, a staging workup. Oftentimes, patients will be staged before they come to you as a surgeon, but you are responsible for making sure that they've actually gotten their full workup before you take them to the operating room. And anytime you're thinking of staging, there's really three components, kind of labs, imaging, and then I call it kind of other, and in the case of colon cancer, that other is really endoscopy, specifically colonoscopy. So when we talk about labs, you should think CEA levels. Imaging is kind of your basic CT oncology, which is just a kind of shorthand for a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and that is with IV contrast. Um, the IV contrast really, is really only needed for the abdominal pelvic portion of the CT, but if you're getting these all at the same time, a lot of times they'll use it for the chest as well. And then scope is, of course, a colonoscopy. But what's important to remember about your colonoscopy is it needs to be complete. So sometimes if you have a partially or fully obstructing lesion, they won't be able to traverse the scope past that lesion. Uh, and if that's the case, they'll need to get a very early repeat colonoscopy post-op when you can reach the rest of the colon because there is a relatively high risk of synchronous disease or two colon cancers being present at the same time. The other thing to think about with your scope is that you want to tattoo the lesion. Uh, to allow you to identify it in the operating room and make sure you take it out because it's very difficult to know exactly where something is anatomically via colonoscopy or CT data. All right, so a little bit more detail uh, into the TNM staging. So T, of course, stands for tumor. Uh, TIS is carcinoma in situ. That's, of course, carcinoma that's just confined to the mucosa right here. T1 involves the submucosa. T2, the muscularis propria, this next layer. T3, they call it the pericoral rectal tissues. Some people call it the subserosa. I never really anatomically understood exactly what those tissues are. So the easiest way I thought to think about T3 is just that the tumor invades past uh, the muscularis propria, but does not actually invade the serosa or the visceral peritoneum yet. T4 is split up into A and B. T4A splits through uh, the visceral peritoneum or the serosa, and T4B uh, progresses beyond that and invades other structures. So a key distinction that you need to think about as a surgeon is going to be uh, the T3, T2 versus T3, and that's going to relate to the adjuvant or post-operative chemotherapy that patients receive. We'll talk more about that later. End staging, also very important, a little bit simpler. So N0 just means no nodes, and then N1 and N2 is one to three or four plus nodes. And again, the cutoff we care about as surgeons is usually the difference between N0 and N1. And again, that's related to adjuvant therapies. And then finally, the easiest staging is always M staging. M0 is no distant metastases, and M1 is the presence of distant metastases. However, in colon cancer, this is a less relevant distinction than it is in many other cancers. In most cancers, we don't operate at all in M1 disease. Uh, with colon cancers, we actually sometimes do. We'll talk about that more on a later slide as well. All right, so first, the question is, who gets upfront surgery? If somebody comes to you as a surgeon with colon cancer, do you operate on them or do you send them for some other sort of therapy? And just for a brief review, whenever you're talking about surgery for cancer, you have to think about not just surgery, but other therapies, primarily chemotherapy and radiation. And there's terms for that, which are, of course, neoadjuvant, and adjuvant therapies. Remember, neoadjuvant therapy is just chemo or radiotherapy that happens prior to surgery, whereas adjuvant is chemo or radiotherapy that happens after surgery. And then, of course, we have surgery here in the middle. Now, interestingly, in colon cancer, there's very little indication for neoadjuvant therapy. It's not really a thing. We're not going to talk about it much in this video. Um, but there are quite a few situations where people would get adjuvant therapy. And what the other thing that, that's important about that in colon cancer is it's usually adjuvant chemotherapy. Very rarely is radiotherapy indicated for colon cancer. So 
for colon cancer, take neoadjuvant and radiation kind of out of your vocabulary, focus on everything else. Um, so anyway, so who gets upfront surgery? So essentially anybody with resectable disease, resectable usually meaning that they don't have any distant metastases, so M0 disease, those patients are going to get surgery first. And then if they're above the T3 cutoff we talked about or the N1 cutoff we talked about, they're going to get adjuvant chemo afterwards. However, some M1 disease, particularly patients with isolated uh, liver lesions or isolated lung lesions, uh, they can actually get a concurrent liver and colon or lung and colon resection, um, which is a pretty unique thing for colon cancer compared to many other types of operations. Uh, if they are getting a liver resection, those patients need an MRI preoperatively. And then the final situation where you may operate on somebody with M1 disease is if they have symptoms that can only be palliated by surgery. And this would primarily be obstruction. We'll talk about that more on a later slide as well. All right, so you decided to offer someone an operation for their colon cancer. What are the principles that you need to think about? One, you want adequate margins in colon cancer that's five to seven centimeters. You want to make sure you get an adequate lymph node harvest for colon cancer that's considered 12 lymph nodes. The way you do that is by getting those nice wide margins. And then you also want to take your arterial blood supply relatively close to the source. It's called something like a high ligation uh, because the lymph nodes tend to uh, run along the arterial blood supply. And then the resections typically respect the blood supply. So what, that, what I mean by that is you wouldn't want to, uh, you want to plan your resections so that they take essentially in arterial territory. You don't want to kind of mix and match. So if somebody has a cancer here in the cecum, you might do a right hemicolectomy where you take a little bit of the ileum and then the right side of the colon, and that's primarily based off the iliocolic and right colic arteries as far as blood supply goes. If the cancer is a little bit higher up, you might extend that, right? Do an extended right hemicolectomy. But again, you want to uh, make sure you leave blood supply. I actually drew this line a little bit left. In this case, you want to probably do it right about here. So you leave your middle colic and give blood supply to the rest of the colon. Um, if you're doing a left-sided hemicolectomy, here you might do just a left. If you had a cancer here, you might do an extended left. You can see how you always want to try to pay attention to where's your middle colic, where's your left colic, where's your right colic, and uh, not perform a resection that's going to compromise your blood supply to another aspect of the colon. And then another consideration when you're doing an operation on the colon is does the patient need to be diverted? And what we mean by diversion is do we need to create either a loop ileostomy or a proximal colostomy uh, that diverts the fecal stream from passing by wherever you did your resection. And I'm not going to get into too much detail there because we very rarely do any sort of diversion when we're talking about colon cancer. Now, rectal cancer is a different story. There's a lot of situations where you do a diversion there, but in colon cancer, it's quite rare. All right, so once you've done your resection, then you got to, again, think about your adjuvant therapy. Remember, in colon cancer, this is primarily chemotherapy. Uh, briefly, it's typically things like full fox, uh, but again, as a surgeon, your job is going to be not to prescribe somebody a chemotherapy regimen, but just to refer them to the medical oncologist. We're not going to go into too much detail about actual regimens, uh, but the patients you'd want to refer, anybody with T3 or greater disease, and by that I mean T3 or T4, T4A, T4B, et cetera, or any patient with any positive nodes, so N1 disease or N2 and one or greater is what that notation is supposed to designate there. Then there's a few special scenarios that we should talk about when it comes to colon cancer. One is kind of a malignant polyp or cancer in a polyp. And the question is, if somebody had a cancer that was only present in a polyp and it got completely removed, does that patient still need to have surgery? And honestly, this is a bit of a complex topic. It could be its own video. Uh, but just a few things to take away. First, you have to know, is this a pedunculated polyp, something that has a stalk on it like this, or is it a sessile polyp, which is something more like this? Pedunculated polyps are more likely to uh, be completely resected just by your polypectomy when you take out the polyp during your colonoscopy, uh, whereas sessile is very difficult to uh, actually remove endoscopically. So for the sake of our discussion here, we'll kind of say, if anyone has a sessile polyp, you should really strongly think about offering them a full formal surgical resection. 
Now, in a pedunculated polyp, if it's out here in the head of the polyp or maybe just up here at the base of the stalk, and you've got good margins, if there's no lymphovascular perineural invasion, of course, this must be a T1 lesion only. Uh, you could consider just getting an early colonoscopy for follow-up on that patient and not giving them a formal resection. But again, um, anytime you hear about cancer in a patient, uh, you really want to think twice before you go with a more conservative management just to avoid a surgery. So if everything's perfect, if the polyp's dunculated, maybe, maybe you can get away without a formal resection. But in most cases, uh, that's not going to be the case. If you're looking for further reading about this topic, there's things called Haggett and the Kikuchi classifications of polyps uh, that were designed to help this decision making, but we're not going to talk about those in this video. All right, another special situation is patients with symptomatic cancers, which is primarily in colon cancer, uh, cancers that are causing bowel obstructions, and patients with unresectable disease, which primarily, primarily means unresectable metastases. And how do you treat that patient? Uh, so there's three options, really. You can divert them. Remember, diverting just means creating a proximal ileostomy or colostomy, which is just a loop of ileum or colon coming to the abdominal wall, which is where fecal material passes through. And using that to uh, divert the fecal stream, uh, you could also, if, if it's a left-sided lesion, um, consider stenting. So sometimes if they can snake a wire past the cancer, they can do a stent, which relieves the obstruction. Or finally, you can actually just go in and resect the, the cancer itself uh, without a diversion. Typically in this situation, I would say diversion or stenting are the two most typical options. The problem with the resection is that you have to wait longer for your chemotherapy than if you had just done a stent or diversion. And since this is an unresectable cancer, their true treatment is going to be chemotherapy. So you don't want to delay that any longer than you have to while you're waiting for some sort of resection to heal. All right, so that was a lot of data, uh, but let's put it all together. So let's say you're a surgeon and a patient comes into you with colon cancer. What are the basic steps? One, you have to make sure they're staged appropriately. This is a classic, any cancer you hear about on the boards or uh, any sort of abscise situation, it's a trap to just go into surgery. You want to make sure your patient's adequately staged. For colon cancer, you want to think about a CEA, getting your CT oncology, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and then a full colonoscopy. Then you need to decide, based on the staging data, does this patient get surgery first? Are they a surgical candidate, or uh, would they need some sort of neoadjuvant therapy? Remember, if it's a resectable colon cancer, you almost never do neoadjuvant therapy. You typically go straight to surgery. Um, when you go to do your surgery, you want to plan your resection based on where the lesion is. Are you doing a right hemicolectomy, left, etc.? cetera? Uh, and the associated colonic blood supply, you want to get nice five to seven centimeter margins, and you want to get 12 lymph nodes. And remember, you're very rarely performing any sort of diversion in a curative cancer operation. Then finally, when we're talking about adjuvant therapy, anybody with T3 or higher or and one or higher disease is going to get referred for consideration of adjuvant therapy. All right, that's it. Uh, this video is for educational purposes only. Do not use this to diagnose or treat any diseases. Uh, this is not clinical advice, uh, and we'll see you next time.